fiction. Science fiction. Horror. Fantasy. Crime. LGBT. Thriller. You have now entered the House of Mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. Good on FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 1050 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. And of course, I'm Al Warren, and we've got uh, Mr. David Martino on the backside. <laughs> the what? The backside. The backside. I oh. was going to say, yeah, ne- never mind. That didn't turn out, but that's okay. <laughs> Yeah, we're never we're never okay. that not correct anyway. So, <laughs> um, well, anyway, so uh, here we go. Got back yep. from another uh, busy day down at the uh, downtown there, and I was doing uh, I was at the protest. Um, Looking for your foreskin? Yeah, the foreskin protest. <laughs> um, you know, I had to get down there and see what was going on, and mm. it was not that exciting because <laughs> I, I don't know why they want their foreskin back after forty years. I don't know. That's crazy. Well, now speaking of that, <laughs> foreskin. <laughs> we've got what a way to enter for this show. We've got we've got a great writer actually, a great Canadian writer, and this is amazing. Um, so he's got another book just uh, come out here, and uh, Mr. David Darling, thank you for uh, going down into your basement in your pajamas well, and talking to us. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Alan. From foreskin <laughs> to pajamas. Wow, you have really broadened your uh, horizons there. Well, you know. We we like to touch all bases. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me back. It's appreciated. So your new book, uh, tell us what's going on there. Now you did this really fast. How did you how did you put this together so fast? Well, on the backside, it appears fast. However, uh, well, first let's start with the title. The, the title is Grim Measures, and one of the things as a writer I wanted to work on, which I constantly work on, uh, is pacing and tension throughout for, for all my novels and with grim measures it didn't even start out as a novel it, it's technically a novel uh, it's 30,000 words one third of a novel and I started this with just the intention of a writing exercise to work on my pace and tension within a novel to see if I could I don't want to I'll just say squish it down and uh, get down to the meat and uh, bones of, uh, of a story and, and go with that so I, I actually started this last fall and uh, in September and then um, as a side project. And then just around Christmas, it, it was pretty much done. And I decided, well, you know what? It's it's no longer a project. It turned into a, a, a pretty darn good story, I like to think. so. Now, is this, is this part of a, the series of what you've been doing or is this something totally different? Uh, no, this is a standalone uh, series, or correction, a standalone novel. So n- not related to my uh, police thriller series at all. What's the idea behind this book? What's the premise? Well, the premise is uh, this single father, his name's John Welland. Uh, one uh, snowy, blustery evening in January, this uh, man lives with his uh, daughter, out in uh, Michigan and his daughter is kidnapped in the middle of the night and there's no trace there's no clue and he's given up all hope a couple months later he gets a phone call from the kidnapper saying he has one chance to get his daughter back but he has to follow the instructions to the letter and it starts off with him having to kill an FBI agent and it the plot goes from there and uh and he follows a series of instructions, and I don't want to give the ending away. So, however, there there is a light at the end of the tunnel. You you write about these um, thrillers and, and and action adventure and all this stuff like that. What is is this kind of like what you hope people um, pick up the book and they run through it, like they read through it and they come out of it? Um, is it just like totally action? Is that sort of what your your output is? That's that's what you want people to get. I, I, I'm not going to lie. I do like a, 
I, as a re- reader, I really enjoy the action scene. If I can read a book and it kind of gets the, the blood pressure up and you, the fingers are shaking a little bit as you're quickly turning the page to find out what happened for for me as a reader that's ideal um as a writer i found to try and write a whole book like that it'll it'll feel like somebody's running a marathon you just there's no chance to recover so that comes back to my practice of uh pacing and tension so i do like to write about that um but not all the time i i, I brought in elements of like I said, this was a writing exercise that turned into a novel. So I have elements of uh, uh, the tension, the, the, f- the fear of a father losing their child, um, a single father. <laughs> he didn't even have his wife to rely on. Um, uh, tense situations as he's looking for her, uh, uh, following the instructions so, uh, of, of the kidnapper, the abductor. So it, it, all, it all accumulates and it builds and builds. But as the writer, one of the things I really like to do at the end is, uh, uh, I want to say, a, like a twist, something that you kind of went, hey, I, I didn't see that coming. But if you read it a second time, you'll see all these foreshadowing events that will dictate what could have happened. So if you paid attention. Well, having written a standalone and you've written uh, some series books, uh, do you have a preference? Do you, do you like to... Uh, write, uh, uh, you know, the, the standalone uh, better than, let's say, a series, or do you like them equally? I'm, I've written, uh, well, this Grim Measures is a standalone, and I've written another novel called, uh, let me look over my shoulder, Serve in the Shadows <laughs> Recruitment, and uh, that's a, also a standalone, and I had a, a good time with that, and I've also written uh, three novels in a series, I think they're just different, uh, different altogether. Uh, it, you know, I'm going into book four on this one series and I feel confident with my characters already that I can start showing some growth development, some changes as the series progresses, which, you know, it's, it's not like a Jack Reacher. He's always stuck in the exact same thing, like a form. Uh, he's, they're growing and developing. Whereas, a standalone is like a snapshot. Boom, it is what it is. So and that part I really enjoy as well. So there, there's advantages and disadvantages to both, I, I think. What do you like reading yourself? Like when you get to that, do you like those Jack Reachers or do, do you like it when there's really a, not a lot of character development, just this little pieces here and there? It's almost like a... Um, just kind of hints to who this person is or how they react to certain situations. But it's, it's, it's generally about the, the, the thrill ride more than the character. Well, it, it, I guess it comes down to two types of novels. You get a, a, a plot or a story based novel or a character development type novel where you're right into the character and I don't care what this character does. I'm going to read it because I really enjoy it. Or, you know, to get into the intricacies of uh, um, the plot, you know, do, do, are, you, are you caught up in the story? So um, I guess the ideal situation is a bit of both. <laughs> and I think that's what makes a really good novel, to be honest. Um, as a reader myself, I, I'm more into the uh, uh, the plot of, of a particular novel. And if it carries on through a series, maybe I'd, yeah, after, after. Well, how many how many Jack Reacher books were there? Twenty six, twenty seven. There should have been some major development, character <laughs> development by the end. You know, yeah. like, geez, something that'd be great. It, it didn't really happen with Jack Reacher, but yeah, maybe maybe near the last few. But uh, I don't want to be too critical because uh, I don't need Lee Child fans uh, beating me up and stuff. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to do that. You know, they might be like Jack Reacher. They come beat you up. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you'd be in trouble. <laughs> well, how do you build your tension? Like, what is what is your tension all about in a, in a book? Are you is it mental suspense? <laughs> is it mental suspense? <laughs> yeah, that you know. Or is it it it's like what? Like, I'm trying to I'm trying to think how you you would characterize um, the suspense in the book. Is it like Alfred Hitchcock style, or how would you talk about it? 
I, I think a good writer could build suspense uh, describing somebody making a peanut butter and jam sandwich. Like it's just, you know, it, it's all in the words and in the play and in the sentences. However, there's a certain style that goes along with, uh, let's just say thriller, a thriller type novel where when you're getting into a tense scene, the, the sentences are going to be shorter, almost clipped. You're going to have abrupt actions. Um, you're going to have, what's behind the door i thought i heard a noise well when the door opened uh boy did he ever get a shock uh, end of chapter <laughs> what what happened next maybe you go on to somebody else's point of view and tell that a little side story before you jump back in there i find those kind of things help build the tension to a certain extent but it's all i find it all based around the the story not necessarily the characters at that point so where did you get the idea for this story I actually started it off as a, a poltergeist, uh, a ghost type story, and then, and then I, I think I believe I mentioned to you during our our last talk, the last interview, how I uh, was was doing a lot of research into uh, human trafficking and uh, abductions and kidnappings and stuff like that. And you'd mentioned a couple of your novels as well, right. and I, I found that to be uh, uh, well. Hey, it's disturbing. <laughs> there's a there's a lot of a lot of sick stuff out there. And w- when I was doing a lot of research for this book, um, I was I was writing. I I I, I cut five thousand words out of this book. Um, a lot of the scenes and chapters were based around uh, the kidnapper's point of view, trying to have the young four year old child integrate into his family and. You, it just got so dark and disturbing. I, I didn't like it. It changed the whole tone of the the novel, and I couldn't do it, so I cut it out. Um, because those those scenes don't end well. And that's just what's going on out in life. So yeah, yeah. No, I mean it is. It's, there's a lot of crazy stuff. I, but that's interesting that you cut it out rather than leave it. It's just about the the total atmosphere of the of the of the story then that you, you just didn't want to get too, too dark, I guess. Well, I, the, the, the main character uh, goes, has his struggles as he's, you know, uh, trying to follow the instructions of the abductor. And then the side story of the abductor having his struggles, trying to raise a four year old that wasn't his and knows it wasn't his. Where's my dad? Uh, it, it just it, that that side story didn't end, couldn't couldn't end well properly. Uh, so I, I had to I had to cut it out, and it, it kind of gave me the creeps. If you want to know the truth, especially as I was writing it, I'm like, yeah, you know what? This is it. it just it wasn't me. I couldn't. I, I did write it, but I couldn't uh, I couldn't keep it. So I I didn't even put it in my uh, my slush folder. I just deleted it. Oh, geez, you could have you could have done the uncut version. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know what? I I'm good with that. I didn't. I wanted a story that, in in the end, had a. Um, well, I don't want to talk about the ending, I guess, but it's <laughs> like I said. There's all there's there's a light at the end of the tunnel, and uh, it's not a train coming towards the main character at full speed. Well, how do you deal with that darkness? Like after you've written stuff that's, you know, extremely dark, uh, do you have to decompress or, you know, how, how do you, um, you kind of get that out of your system? It, it stays with you, to be honest. I And you relive, relive those scenes. Like some of those scenes I wrote were, were vivid. And uh, that's how I, I, picture, I picture them in my mind. And then, then I write along with it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some mornings I'd wake up at 4.30 in the morning and I would, I can still see the scene. I'm going, no, that th- this scene wouldn't go like that. It would have to happen like this. And next thing I know, I'm making coffee at five o'clock. And I'm downstairs and I'm rewriting something because it just made sense because I can visualize it. With the dark stuff like that, it, it kind of... It stays with you. You think about it. Um, you know, uh, most writers on their deathbed, their their final wishes for somebody to delete their browsing history because, <laughs> man, you know they, they they you know they 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 do the research. They look around and they find out about all this stuff that's it's just not that nice. 
No, and the, and the trafficking world's really kind of a dark. I think when I did the In Chains book, the hardest thing was um, not, well, for me, it was it was the shock of what was going on. Uh, there, yep. there were things happening that uh, it didn't even cross my mind could happen or would be happening. It was just kind of a shock, and then that shock stays with you long after the book because you, <laughs> you can't, just can't believe that that's going on today in the world, Mm -hmm. you know? Well, have you read, um, it's called the chain by, uh, Adrian McKinty. No, I don't think so. Uh, it's fairly new. Came out last year. It just exploded on the charts. Stephen King endorsed it. So anything he endorses will, uh, take over the world. Um, you know, it was, it's basically, uh, a kidnapping book. Uh, this, woman's daughter was kidnapped and she can get her daughter back however she has to kidnap somebody else's child and then the woman who kidnapped her daughter will let will get her son back from somebody else and then it's a constant chain of events of kidnapping and ransom and money handing over to the the bad guys and uh and and that was one of the things i had almost i i wish i i well, I'm glad I didn't now. I, I was going to include that in my novel as one of the things the the, the kidnapper to uh, have the main character get his daughter back at the end, give me a replacement. But I'm so glad I didn't because it was just already done and I didn't know it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's a pretty um, dark subject. Was it, were you hoping to get something out of that, um, getting into this sort of kidnapping trafficking area in a in a fiction novel i go i go about it as a fictitious mindset you know the daughter the young girl was missing there's no clues um the kidnapper the abductor always seems to have the upper hand and no information that the fbi didn't have stuff like that Would would i have done it different Uh, no no i wanted i wanted to keep it focused on the journey of the man getting his daughter back and what he goes through. So, Wow. I would think that's still pretty, um, it must have been pretty uh, draining process for you because you're, um, you say you visualize your characters, you visualize the scenes. For sure. Well, I'm also a parent, so I can, I can understand that the, absolute agony you know somebody must go through and to be honest no you don't you don't really know until it happens to you i'll I'll give everybody that boy can i picture it and to me that would just whatever you take my car take my house set it all on fire whatever but you know you touch my daughter oh man that just cuts to the quick doesn't it so yeah yeah that would Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, so your character. So when you, when you're doing that, like, so, what's your process? How do you, how do you, um, are you like driving down the road and all of a sudden a scene comes to your head, and um, that's kind of where the the story initiates, or is it something that are you in a certain place or position, or do you put yourself in a certain mood? Where does where does this, this idea begin? Well, I'll, I'll talk about um, last week's idea. My wife watches a, a lot of these uh, Hallmark Christmas Easter <laughs> seasonal movies. I mean, I always boy, wondered she... who did that. Yeah, uh, <laughs> actually, I know one of the authors. Her name's Jenny Hale. She's a fabulous writer. Her... But anyway, I, I've been joking with her on Twitter, saying, "Oh, my wife wants me to write one of these stories," and I'm going, oh, man, I'm, "I'm a police thriller, uh, psychological thriller kind of guy at heart." So I go, I don't even know where to start. So anyway, I, I said, ah, I'd give it a shot. So I started. I started last week. It's not going to quite turn out to be a Hallmark kind of book, but um, <laughs> I just had a concept, you know, uh, let's go with it. So I started the, the vacationing couple in the Bahamas. And soon, and I, I'm, I'm already 10,000 words into this story since last week. So and it's quickly changed from... Uh, uh, a romantic couple honeymoon kind of situation to uh oh there's a death uh, at the resort and then another death it was all these people that had met up together in nasa in the bahamas at a, and they're all staying at this one resort and uh, it ends up going to be the and i decided to have the 
instead of the superhero kind of person uh, being, you know, the U.S. Army Ranger or a CIA agent, the big tough guy, it's going to be uh, the woman, the the wife, and she's there on assignment, and her husband doesn't know anything about it, but now he has to help her out because uh, she's been compromised. So stuff like that, it, it's just, it keeps changing, and I'm going with it. So it's it's actually coming along rather well. I'm kind of surprised. <laughs> I wanted to write a novel in the first person from the husband's point of view and uh, uh, what a different world that is. So yeah, good times. <laughs> well, you talk about visualizing your characters. C- can you hear them? I just want to know if you hear voices, but is that how you create your dialogue or uh, do you have another method? Can I visualize them? <laughs> yes. Yes. I, yes, I can. I can, I can, I visualize them enough in my head that I can hear them. Am, am I talking to them? No, I, I'm not talking to them. <laughs> However, uh, <laughs> I do. I can, well, you know, <laughs> I said, hi, pop on over. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, I can hear them. Like what's, what makes sense? You know, uh, they go through this internal dialogue. Writers will go through this internal dialogue thing in their mind, and you know, pen, if you're alone, you look around the room, and sometimes you'll talk things out too. Uh, action scenes, uh, fight scenes. Uh, I, you know, I've been in martial arts for 37 years now, but mm-hmm. I still get up in the living room and I pretend to throw a right hook at this uh, my opponent, and then I switch to the opponent's side and I move in the living room, <laughs> and I and I. And I do an upper block and I do a snap kick or something. And, you know, and then I, Oh, yep, that'll work. That'll work. You know, and then I go back and I write it all out. Or I did that for a knife fight scene once, you know, so I'm, I'm acting it out. So, um, I've done the same thing. Cause I've, yeah. I studied martial arts myself for over 30 years. Oh, what, what, uh, what styles? Um, Taekwondo, uh, Japanese Jiu Jitsu, Jeet Kune Do. Oh, nice. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. I'm all, you? I'm all, I'm all Japanese. I started off with judo for 11 years, okay. and I went into uh, the key jiu-jitsu, yep. uh, kido jiu-jitsu kind of blend, and then uh, I'm still wrapping up and in uh, with karate right now. And uh, uh, I, I've done, you know, six years of tai chi, and uh, I've messed around with some Wing Chun guys and mm. Taekwondo guys I've sparred with. So it's all fun. It's I all great the... stuff. Oh, good, good. Well, you're a normal person then. Okay, yeah, that's right. great. Yeah, I'm the only <laughs> abnormal one. You know, it, it, actually, my dad used to use high karate. <laughs> the, the, uh, uh, the cologne. The cologne, yes. Yeah. Does that count? Oh, there you go. Does that count? Does that... No, that's, yeah. you're, you're almost a brother. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's really sad, you know. Oh, the, the only part is, it's like, you know, you're you're 18, and you know you have this fake ID, and then you go get some beer, and then you turn 19, and nobody ever asks you for ID. Yeah. I found the same thing with martial arts. I've never gotten into any problems, or I just look at them, and I'm mm. like, Do you really want to do this? Because I'm I'm really ready. Yeah. I've got almost four <laughs> decades of studying, buddy. You have no idea how ready I am. But 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 if you're not, I, I'm go I'm cool too. But you know, it, it, nothing ever happens. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, geez, you know, um, I've got nothing. I'm barely uh, rode a bike, so I don't know. You know. <laughs> oh, well, well, you know, somebody's somebody's got to do it. So, so when you you said you were talking about the poltergeist sort of thing, are you sort of into the paranormal? How could a billion people be wrong? <laughs> like, come on! What is it? One in seven people believe in. Some form of the afterlife, ghosts, um, things that go bump in the night. There's so much out there that can't be explained. That I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I think there's I, there's got to be something there. I, I have a theory and an idea. I kind of brought that into my first novel I wrote, and uh, you know, serve in the shadows recruitment was about a, a U.S. Army Ranger, and uh, whose brother died while on assignment with the CIA. However, he quickly finds out he can still talk to his brother. His brother's dead. And they finish off the assignment that his brother was on. And, you know, this, they save the world and the, the terrorists and all that. One, one, one thing I have learned, uh, something always transitions from one form to another. And that's energy. You can't lose energy. It doesn't mm-hmm. work that way. It just gets transformed into another form. We have... 13 trillion synapses going on in our brains right now. And that all forms energy, even down to the quantum level. 
And when, when our bodies shut down, the energy has to go somewhere. It just doesn't dissipate into the, the world. So that, that form, that energy has to go somewhere. And as to where, well, I guess we're all going to find out one day, but uh, right now I, I don't have an answer. Well, yeah, I just, when you, when you bring it into your books like that, does that come from personal experience or is that just a kind of a belief, a far out thought of, well, this is the way, you know, you're talking about energy. That's kind of how you see it um, mm-hmm. and a possibility. And that's, you know, fair enough. But have you had any run-ins yourself? Once when I was a child, actually. So um, I was, you know, watching the love boat and fantasy island out in the living room. <laughs> and uh, The way it always starts. <laughs> yeah, man, if I had a nickel. Um, and so my, my mom was out in the kitchen cleaning up, and my sister, my little sister had already gone to bed. And I looked up, and I thought, well, I, I didn't think. I know. I can still see it to my mind, and it's been well, quite, quite a while, <laughs> 44, 45 years. Um, I, I can still see the figure crawling down the hallway, and it looked like some sort of shimmering white blanket over top and i go to i just said mom heather's up or my sister's up she's crawling down the hall and we came out because she would have crawled down the hall and turned into my bedroom because you could see it we had an old wartime bungalow and we went into my room and she there was nobody there and then i went down i checked my mom's room checked the the bathroom and my mom opened my sister's bedroom door and she's still in bed sleeping and there was just the three of us in the house <laughs> and i still see it. i could still see that to this very day it's one of those things you'll never forget and my mom's like okay great yeah <laughs> so well, maybe it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's what happens if you watch Tattoo and Fantasy Island. Yeah, just, yeah. yeah. You go in, the ghost, boss, the ghost. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's the ghost. It's the ghost. Yeah. I can see it now. I can see it happens all the time, right? Oh, no doubt. Yeah. Well, that's in, what's well, interesting that something like that stays with you. You know what I mean? All of these years. I mean, this last century, you know. There's just absolutely no scientific logical explanation for it so you know same as all the all the ufo stuff going on well there's always been ufos uh now we kind of got proof but nobody seemed to care because donald trump was running the country at the time and uh, (laughs) they were just worried about uh, staying alive (laughs) yeah yeah, they had their own dumpster fires to put in (laughs) meanwhile people were putting proof of ufos online and nobody's yeah oh that's great you know whatever but donald trump did you hear what he did today yeah so well i think i think the problem with the whole uh, paranormal is because it became televised it became a trend you know all the the ghost Mm -hmm. hunting shows and the ufo shows and and that and i think people are inundated with all of these theories and and a lot of them are crazy you know, they don't they don't just sit on, okay, we've we've seen this or spotted this or this person had this experience. There's so much um exaggeration on the T V market mm-hmm. that you create a lot of doubt um in people. Because um, I don't doubt it, but uh, a lot of the shows are, are crazy. <laughs> you know, yeah, I do watch the History Channel too, and they, boy, do they take that to an extreme sometimes. So. Yeah, you know, it kind of goes too far, and um, it's just entertainment. People got to realize that. So there's this line, but um, what? So and that also leads to what? What kind of formula do you use then when you? Because when you talk about a poltergeist or you talk about hauntings and stuff like that, or when when the when the um, the officer, the guy was talking to his brother who was dead. Mm-hmm. What kind of formula do you use? Do you take from what's already sort of happened? Do you know what I'm saying? Like we have kind of these tropes, these ideas of someone is a ghost and they, they appear as themselves and, uh, you know, they follow through in the story and stuff like that. Do you just sort of take what's been built on or do you have your own kind of theories? I guess... I started creating my own, mostly in my mind. It, they're, they're there in the novel. However, you'd have to 
write it all out, I guess, and to, to understand it. I, I created a set of rules. You know, he can't, um, he's always in a fixed spot. Uh, he, he doesn't wander around too much. Like if the one character gets into a vehicle, he doesn't sit in the vehicle with him. He, he'll be on the other end waiting or something, uh, at the destination. Uh, he always appears to be the same, you know, he's not aging. He's not getting younger. He's, he is what he is. And he's, he's dressed casually. Same, same as, you know, when the moment he'd passed away or, or, in that particular case was murdered um is he, the I, I took it for the the character in the novel is you know he's he's uh he's a full character like he has dialogue and interacts with the main character as well the the, the dead brother and you know i proposed that idea that you know how, how is this happening how come i can see you and nobody else can that kind of thing and uh, the theory I, I put forth in the novel was the fact that uh, uh, you know, the neurons in the brain, you're my brother, maybe there are patterns are close enough that uh, they're allowing me to interact with you. You can just see this. Um, and then I proposed the idea, is this happening to other people out there uh, in a similar manner, but we can't see them. So is this happening or other people seeing ghosts, but they're, the ghosts are saying, "Hey, uh, don't don't tell anybody, because you know I'm dead. <laughs> uh, we, we we don't know. So, and hey, maybe it's happening. I I don't know. I'm not. Uh, I'm pretty pretty sure it's not. But uh, uh, but, but then again, I don't know all the answers either. So so you better you better, the idea. you better watch what you do, even when you're alone at home. <laughs> <laughs> you know, walk. Yeah, up, yeah. You know, someone's watching you." For sure. I'm okay with that. <laughs> now, I, I I do try and steer clear of the religion in the books, though. This is happening because of a religious reason. I'm, a, I'm trying to avoid conflict in that regard, meaning I, I try and avoid talking about religion and I toy in politics. Uh, if you can avoid those two major things, you're, you're going to be okay <laughs> for the most part in conversations with people. So I, I try and do that same thing in the book, you know. Well, for for I, I'm hoping for obvious reasons for readership, to be honest. Yeah. So I don't want to I don't want to piss a lot of people off. Yeah, and I think I think well, you know, it, it rightfully so. These days, people are very, as soon as they hear something political, or they hear something religious, they 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 get on edge and they either want to defend or they want to attack it. You know, there's not there's no there's no wiggle room right now so it's it's probably better to stay away from that in writing um and it shouldn't be that way um i don't know why it's become so i don't know black and white you know so coarse because there's no reason that you can't you can't have someone nobody's perfect so you you know Mm -hmm. i don't know why you can't just people can't just talk about it rather than you know I'm, I'm sort of confused with that. Does it, it, also with today's society, do, did you look to be careful on how you worded things so that it would be kind of, you know, politically correct, I guess is the term. Uh, do, are you careful on how you? Um... Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, I'm not trying to be an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't want to mince words here um yeah and, and and if you're an asshole and i'm offending you i am sorry so um yes i'm not gonna i'll just take um uh, one example would be like i don't use the word uh, midget within my novels right um you know you're a short person or uh, i guess the new technically technically the new term uh or a politically correct term would be a vertically challenged. Okay. <laughs> hey, you know, if, if, if that's the way it is, that's the way it is. Okay. Um, am I going to lose readers? Am I going to be sued? I, I don't know. Uh, I hope not. I, and, and that was an example. I never did use that. So please don't skim my books looking for such words. Yeah. I'm going to look um, for it now. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> good, good luck. Good luck. Um, you know, that's it's the same. It's the same concept. I don't want to. I, I want to entertain. I'm here to entertain people. And um, 
and, and that's that's my main goal. I, I want to entertain you. I want you when you finish my novel to go. Oh my god, that was good. I didn't see that ending coming. And I go. That, he goes. That was worth staying up late for. Not. Um, wow, he used the word midget 432 <laughs> times. Like what? I guess he has his own shortcomings or something. Yeah, right? yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so yeah. So that was. I want to focus on the story. I don't want to focus on uh, things that could be otherwise said uh, properly. And that's where I'd rather do it. No, and I agree totally. I'm the same way. I really, um, I really don't understand the anger behind a lot of it. Well, I can see it in some cases, but Mm -hmm. I just sort of think that um, the last thing I want to do is, is hurt or upset someone. Or get yeah, get them sure. get them feeling bad about themselves. So I try to avoid that as well. But the thing is, like you and I were of a certain age, that um, we grew up in a certain condition. So some things are just yeah. come out of your mouth without thinking because that's just where we grew up. So um, I, I just don't understand the anger on that when it's not meant to hurt someone. And you just say like, if you just said midget. It would be that's just all we ever said when we were young, right, right up till just recently, and then all of a sudden it's like, no, you can't say that. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, if someone says that and tells you why, then I know. But before someone brings it to your attention, you don't really know. So mm-hmm. it's one of those fine lines. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm also. You know, I'm open. Like I just, if if I'm doing something wrong or this is offensive to you, let me know. And I go, well, why is it offensive? Well, I don't like the way you did this. Well, I got some good news for you. And I go, it's okay to be offended, but don't expect me to make all these changes because simply one person's offended. Um, you know, if, if I'm offending, uh, you know, several hundred thousand people, <laughs> then, then I would, well, first, thank you for buying my book. <laughs> Two, um, I, would, I, would be, I would be like, well, why is that offensive? Oh, I had absolutely no idea. I'm really sorry. I apologize. Allow me to do some corrections here. Uh, and, then I'll, and I won't do it again. Yeah. You know, but if you're on your high horse because it's okay to be offended, guys. Move on. Keep scrolling. Don't let, don't read that part. <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. I think I say that to people all the time when they complain about me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, turn the channel because I just want, I really don't want to hurt anybody. I don't want to upset anybody, but it happens, but it's certainly not. I'm just trying to get some laughs and, and have good conversations. Yeah. It's not, there's nothing mean going on here. I just, it's just ridiculous to think that, but it, people will take mm. that. You know, one of the uh, publisher I was working with a while back um, wanted to make some pretty aggressive changes or aggressive, but there were changes that were sort of, you know, I didn't realize, like, when I, the word ghetto, of course, had to be changed to working class neighborhood. Right. And things like that. Just just things that I didn't even think about. You know, it just, it just, it, it almost shocked me in a way. Mm-hmm. Uh, because isn't it really more about our intention? Like, when I say something yes. to someone, isn't it really about if I'm saying it with hate and I, or I hate you and call you a name and, and you're being, oh, you know, I hate this race or I hate this religion or I hate gay people and say they say something really bad in a bad firm. Isn't that really kind of what we're trying to stop here? Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, that's, you know, I ha- we had a discussion a few days ago in uh, my writing group and it was uh, about the word uh, manpower. Oh yeah. <laughs> should 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 we be using the word manpower? Well, and, and then the alternative was, what are we going to call it? People power? <laughs> no, that doesn't. So you know, is is manpower offensive? So and that started the whole. Boy, this went on for a while. I bet. So, um, yeah. Yeah, and, and the end result, we we don't know. <laughs> well, because, you know, again, you know, you're just saying it because you all know what it means. I don't see mm-hmm. that as being, you know, so I guess it's because we didn't say woman. Uh, they're not included, I guess, woman power, manpower. But manpower, I, it's like it's like when I heard that with some of the realtors taking away master suite in the U.S. Right. Because they don't want master. So it's first room, second room, third bedroom. Yeah. Like they're no longer master suite. So 
And to me, I, that's going to be a hard one to break. Isn't that just something we've said our whole life? Mm. Well, I, like it come, I guess it just for me it comes back to who who am I offending? Am I offending anybody? This is, you know, maybe I'll. Uh, I, I'm not here to offend anybody. I'm here to get along with everybody. And if if you know, I'm talking to a whole bunch of people or friends and stuff, and they're all offended by me using the word manpower. I don't see it, but and I go, okay, well then I'll. We'll switch to something else. Whatever. <laughs> Change it to whoa, man, power. I don't know. I mean, it's like, how about dog power? Cat power? Yeah. You know, yeah. Cheetah power? That. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it seems. It just seems like it's. It, well, you know, and especially with the world. I mean, there's a lot of things going on. That it's, there's a lot of tension in the world. A lot of bad things mm-hmm. happening, and it's just like, I think uh, it's kind of better to focus on more um, things like that personally. Yeah, I'm all. I'm right with you. You know, um, but who am I, right? Well, that's what <laughs> even uh, on uh, what was it uh, February 27th? Grim measures came out, and uh, all week long I've been trying to advertise and promote my novel, and I didn't feel like it. You know why? <laughs> People are dying in Ukraine, and there's another war going on, and here I am in Canada trying to sell a novel and I go oh my god how, how... <laughs> like it just the relevancy of it diminished in my mind so much yeah but, uh, I couldn't it doesn't even compare right here th- these are my problems th- this is my problem I'm trying to uh break uh, Facebook algorithm so I could uh, get better <laughs> demographics for my uh my yeah. novel yeah. and and people are are walking uh 12 miles with a newborn child to reach Poland so they're safe yeah <laughs> you know no uh, just, yeah well and it's disturbing i you know for me it's disturbing not only for the people but also because i don't know i guess i was really naive thinking in the 90s and after the berlin wall f- fell in 89 and all this stuff i thought we were all moving in this direction of freedom and mm-hmm. um you know, it's not perfect, but we're going in the right direction. And this last few years, it seems to be like a real breakdown of that. There's no, there's no togetherness there, and and, and this useless attack on people. Like it just the whole um, thing is disturbing, you know. And and it's uh, and it's hard to watch things. Like you know, I guess they were just having some awards show, and everyone's talking about the dress the person was wearing. It's just like. Yeah. It just it just seems so out of place. Yeah, you know. Well, I uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I was in the Army, uh, Canadian Reserves, for seventeen years, and if my situation were different, if I wasn't married and I didn't have a child right now, maybe in a, a bit younger, I would probably pack my bags and go join them. They're looking for recruits that are coming to help the Ukrainian Army. I, I'd I'd get I'd be there. I think. I uh, would, uh, Canada can't send troops. They're sending equipment and supplies, but, uh, I would, uh, right now I still feel the call. I still feel compelled to do something, you know, even if it's just going to be a red cross donation. So, um, yeah, well, I, I just, you know, it's important. <laughs> what do you do? Yeah. It's important, uh, to, 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 to look at that and do things like that because we've got to help each other because it's, uh, um, it can turn around. It could be a, you know, I, a news guy I know out of um, the Vancouver market. I know when he he posted something about that, about uh, what would it be for if the U.S. decided that they want to take Canada for the resources and walk in and do the same thing. You know, um, you know, it's kind of in to that scale. It can happen anywhere. We think it can't, but weird things happen. Oh, for sure. Yeah, my heart goes out to them, and uh, so if, if this is affecting anybody that's listening, uh, boy, have you got my sympathies, and I wish you nothing but uh, all the best, and I hope there's nothing but a, a good good outcome from this yeah. that'll last for a thousand years. Yeah. How was that for you writing during this time, too, and, and all that? Does it- you know what? I find it, um, it – it's the relevancy. Here I, Here I am trying to – write a novel, continue on with my life. And uh, on the news, as my wife watching the news, you're seeing, you know, bombed out buildings. And uh, uh, what, what do you, <laughs> you just, 
just kind of sets the, it changes your perspective. It really does. So, um, yeah, yeah. Oh, totally. priorities. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad. I mean, it's, it's good to have good people like you out there that, that think about these and you're, and, it, it, and you do realize that, you know, you sort of, it makes you aware of how lucky things are for, for you at the time. Right. You know, puts you in a, mm. in a good place. So. That's excellent. For sure. So, it, so now the book is out. Um, is this going to be in bookstores too, or is this just an Amazon? Uh, right now it's on um, uh, ebook only, and it's from Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, Kobo, uh, Indigo, uh, all over. And there's there's a dozen different places. It, they're literally pretty much anywhere you can get a, an ebook from. You can download Grim Measures. Now we're going to link that up to our site as well. And do you have a do you have a web page as well now? I do. It's uh, uh, daviddarlingbooks.com. And the second tab in there is books, and there's links to all my novels in there. Do you like uh, doing social media with 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 readers or with people that follow you? Or to be honest, I'm not a fan of social media. I I almost. <laughs> if, it, if it wasn't for the significant fact of keeping in touch with family and posting pictures for your family. So, you know, my, my great aunts and all of them can see it. And, and my mom, uh, uh, I probably wouldn't have done it as a writer. Wow. Do you ever need it? Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, just, just for getting the word out. Uh, it takes one person on Twitter to like your comment and that shows up on uh, all their friends, Twitter feed. And then one other person might like it and it shows up on all, you know, uh, two friends and so on and so on. So in that regard, uh, you need it. But one thing I've, I'm finding and it's just making my day is the reader comments, uh, the retweets, the, the sharing. Boy, do I love that. I love hearing back from, uh, everybody that's been reading my novels. And I've, I've heard a couple of good comments today saying, uh, all these agents that turned David Darling down are utter fools. His books are fantastic. And it just went on and on. Like, oh my God. I'm like, who is this guy? <laughs> so, <laughs> my God, like, let me send you something. So yeah. So I just love it. I, in that regard, I, I truly do uh, benefit from uh, social media in that regard. Yeah. I think, I think it's important just to look for the good things. I think it's with us. It's here. It's now. It's going to keep on going and move further and, and develop into even more, more of an interaction. So I think it's a good thing. You just got to kind of look at the good things you can get out of it. You know, you, you meet some For really sure. good people. You hear some really good things and, and that. And just, you know, just delete the other ones. <laughs> you know, that's what it's there for, you know. You got don't, it. Don't don't waste your time getting mad. I was just say, well, bye bye, you know, and stuff. What's your favorite yeah. social media? Are you you like a real TikTok guy? I could see you on there dancing with the. the well, I, I'm I'm not going to lie. I, I I did create a TikTok account because my wife says, you know, there's there's a hashtag on tiktok called book talk right. and authors are selling books on through tiktok and i went what there's another way to sell books i'm in <laughs> so uh, that day i started creating some content um you know i put an old picture of a moose swimming across the river while i was fishing that was <laughs> that got more likes than my novel picture but uh yeah i've i've sold books through tiktoks whatever if, if there's a way to do it i'll I'll figure it out. Oh, but I'm you, not, you, not on it all. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, I had um, someone had bought one of my books and they um, had it signed, and then they were on TikTok and they showed that them opening the book with the signature and that, and they flashed yes. that around and got a couple thousand likes. It's like crazy. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. So you know. Well, if you if you watch a. Uh, dragon's den and that one uh the guy who owns the mavericks uh mark um oh cuban yeah cuban yeah. yeah he he pretty much says right now he goes if you're not selling and advertising on tiktok you're dead he goes if you can't put a 10 to 15 second commercial out he goes you're dead he goes you're not making anything he, yeah. <laughs> and this is you know <laughs> multi-billionaire so yeah i'll uh 
Yeah. I'll listen to them. No, and my wife. Yeah. My wife. Oh, yeah. Well, you kind of have to there, right? But yeah, uh, yeah. Cuban doesn't know if you don't listen to him, but your wife does. So. <laughs> <laughs> There's a difference there. How did you know? But I just know how, how these things know? work. You know, I've heard. I've uh, read books. It's almost like you're psychic or something. Well, Good times. Yeah, let's not go that far. But. Well, uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for coming on the show and, and helping us out here. It's always a good thing. So now the book. Well, thank you. The book people need to buy. And if you don't, you're you're just crazy. Uh, this is like, you know, come on. It's two ninety nine for a Kindle, and it's called Grim Measures. Okay, so this is something you need. And it's by the one and only David Darling. And that's his real name, okay? So you can't. True story. Yeah, you can't forget that. <laughs> So, um, again, David, thank you for coming on the show. Well, thank, thank you, Alan, and thank you, David. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure, and uh, uh, I'll always appreciate it. Thanks, David. Tired of wasting time trying to decide what to watch on your streaming service? Go to our website and look for the Martino Movie Reviews. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back. <laughs>